So all of heaven is watching the earth all the time, looking for a man or a woman that's going to use the Word of God, that's going to speak the Word of God, that's going to move on the Word of God. And when they do, heaven moves. Hello everyone, we are thrilled to be with you today. And we're here with some wonderful friends that we have just met a little over a year ago with the Apostle Ricardo Watson and his wonderful wife, Carrie. They're four beautiful children and their property is called Miracle Mountain. <laughs> they have a beautiful piece of property yes. here. I don't even know how many acres it is, but yeah. we've walked around, looked at it uh, last year and, and also this year. And yes. right now, this week, I'm ministering uh, at the church. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing four days. Uh, and uh, tonight will be the third the third session uh, of the four. Right. And uh, we, we've had a good time. It's been absolutely wonderful. The mir Talk about Miracle Mountain. This place is a miracle. And it is a praying church, a worldwide evangelism church. And it's people that are come together to really focus on taking authority and helping America get set back up straight and uh, get the, the, the righteous in control and the Word of God honored and save our babies and our children and uh, secure our borders and do all of these things. And that's what this ministry is focused on in prayer doing. I'm telling you what a tremendous, amazing group of people that have set themselves to pray for America. And so, well, Dorman, you've been teaching some you know, things that have really helped them. Well, yeah, and you know, uh, uh, Ricardo and Carrie Lee are from South Africa. Right. And right. Uh, they've only been in the States, uh, well, they have been in the States for a number of years now, about 20, but they've been here on this property just for about uh, three years now. Yeah. And uh, I, I hadn't figured out what time to come to church yet because <laughs> so far, every time I've come to church early, yeah. He's already started. Yeah, so he starts early praying. every service. So, I'm telling you. Uh, we arrived Sunday and we got here like 25 minutes early and he's already going. And uh -huh. then we came in Monday night, you know, uh, uh, last night and uh, got here early and he was already going. So I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but I, I keep trying to get earlier so <laughs> so I can get here on time. Well, it's it been outstanding. Terry shared last night uh, out of 3 John 2 and the history of what the Apostle John was trying to do and and tell people that, the, you know, that if you're going to look at everything that has to do with the gospel and you're going to go to the world, you're going to help the people of God and you are going to be able to reach souls and do evangelism and outreach and all of these things that have to do with uh, building buildings and, and uh, putting in air conditioning and driveways. They have a glory barn over here that seats 2,000. And so God's on the move and um, everything that we're sharing is to be a, help them do what they're doing. Isn't that right? No, we absolutely. just got a minute here and we're going to take a break. Yeah, well, thank God for the word, you know. And so yeah. we've been we've been ministering last night, as you said, I ministered on Third John. John was 90 plus years old yeah. when he wrote Third John. Now, I'm sure John wrote more than three letters to the churches. Uh, all the epistles are a great missionary statesman writing missions letters to missions churches. And I'm sure they wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters over that number of years. But the Holy Ghost every now and then would say, ah, this one needs to be in the Bible. Right. This letter needs to go to the saints down in 2022, right. 2,000 years from now. And so uh, uh, that's what uh, that's what third John was. John actually took pen in hand right. just simply to write a letter to a local church about a bad guy named Diotrephes. And he said, I'll take mm -hmm. care of him when I get there. And then a good guy named Demetrius. Uh, but then the Holy Ghost got on him and he actually wrote uh, this marvelous eight verses about how he wants us to prosper and be in health and why that's true. Well, we're going to come back in just a moment and we're going to tell you some more about all of that and encourage your faith. Turn in your Bible to uh, the book of Revelation. 
And don't get excited about that because we're not going to preach there. I just, I just had you turn there because you know where it's at. It's, it's easy. It's easy for you to find. Once you get there, have you got there? When you, then turn left and go all the way through the book of Jude, the whole book of Jude, all 21 verses of it, and stop at 3 John. <clears throat> all the epistles, all the epistles uh, are nothing but uh, missionary letters, great letters. Epistle means letter. I used to think that an epistle was a wife of an apostle, but that's not true. Epistle just means letter. It, it, some see, yeah. But they're, they're, every one of them are written by missionaries. Peter, James, Paul, John, missionaries, every one. So all the epistles are great missionary letters written by great missionary statesmen to the missions churches if they started. All right? And no telling how many letters these guys wrote to the churches. They may have written hundreds of them, but every now and then the Holy Ghost, say Holy Ghost, every now and then the Holy Ghost say, that one I want in the Bible. That one I want in the Bible because that one needs to talk to the saints 2,000 years from now. And a lot of letters were just personal letters about the church and what was going on in the church and what's happening in the church. It doesn't affect us at all. Uh, but every now and then, they'd talk to something that's, that's so powerful that needs to go on forever. And the Holy Ghost say, okay, that one. It's like here we've got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We've got, we've got three letters that John wrote. Well, I'm sure John wrote hundreds of letters. I mean, he was, nine, he was over 90 years old when he wrote 3 John. So, so in those 90 years, I'm sure that he had written a lot of letters. But yet three of them, the Holy Ghost said, uh, that, needs to, that needs to be in the Bible for the saints down in 2022. Right? So every time we read one of these, we need to realize this is real special. Because I'm sure Paul wrote more than one letter to the Corinthians, more than one to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, to the Thessalonians. But yet certain ones, the Holy Ghost said, yeah, this one needs to go for... Terry's, Terry's down there. He's going to need this in a couple thousand years. Right? So we need to always look at it like that, that the Holy Ghost is talking to us from these apostles, from these missionaries. You know, missionary is just an apostle, right? The word, the, word, uh, the word missionary isn't even in the Bible anywhere. We can't even blame that on our translators. Most things we can blame on the translators. We can't even blame that on the translators. The, the, word, the word missions or missionary came from the Latin word mito, M-I-T-T-O, meaning one sent out or a sent one or I send. Well, the Greek word apostelos, so we get our word apostle from, means one sent out or a sent one or I send. So missionaries are simply apostles uh, for the most part. Not every, let me confuse you really good here. Uh, uh, every missionary, <laughs> excuse me, every apostle will be a missionary, but not every missionary will be an apostle. Is that clear as mud? You know, let's say I'm in, in Africa or, or India or the Southeast Asia and doing a crusade and God's falling and miracles are happening and things are going on. And so I, I write a letter or send a text or a message back to the States, to, to Tulsa or to Dallas or here or there. And I say, send me some missionaries. I need some help. Uh, and I need some people that can build platforms, some carpenters. I need some people that can string the lights and put up the sound system. I need some le electricians and sound techs. I need some people that can uh, drive the trucks. I need some people that can work on the truck mechanics. And I, and I need some secretaries that can write some letters for me. I, I need some people to help me. Well, the church would send those people over and they would be missionaries and worthy of missionary support and missionary prayer. But they wouldn't be apostles. They'd be ministry of help sent to help the apostle get the job done. Does that make sense to you? So that's what these are. These are great missionary statesmen, great apostles writing mission letters to mission churches that they, they had started. And so I want you to understand something about John here. He was over 90 years old when he wrote this. I don't know if that does anything for you or not, but it does volumes for me. When I think this guy's not some 17-year-old snotty-nosed Bible school student, it doesn't know enough to get in out of the rain. This guy has been there, done that, <laughs> bought the T-shirt, right? Uh, John is the only one of the 12 disciples of the Lamb that wasn't martyred. Now, they tried to martyr him. They tried to kill him. They boiled him in oil. And he just said, oh, it's a nice hot oil bath. That feels so good. 
Now, I heard one preacher not very long ago, not very long ago on radio, I heard, I heard a preacher say, oh, I tell you, John was so scarred and so marred and so crippled by being boiled in oil the rest of his life. I said, hogwash, where'd you get that? No, he just lay there and had him a little oil bath and then got out and said, you guys done? So they couldn't kill him, so they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote this little book called Revelation. And then when he got through with that, then he finished his sentence and came home. And he's the only one of the 12 disciples of the Lamb, we call him, that wasn't martyred, that didn't die a premature death. He lived to a ripe old age. He's the only one that lived to a ripe old age and enjoyed his wife and his kids and his grandkids and his great-grandkids and enjoyed all his ministry. So this guy, this guy's got some credentials. When we're talking about John, we're talking about somebody that's walked with Jesus. He was there when Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. He was there when Jesus killed the fig tree with his words. He was there when the blind eyes were open and the deaf ears were stopped. He, he was there every time. He was there for the crucifixion. He was there. None of them were there for the resurrection because none of them believed he'd come back, but he was there right after the resurrection, right? And uh, he was there on the day of Pentecost and got the Holy Ghost. A few days later, he's walking into the temple and there's a crippled guy that's been there for over, God's over 40 years old. Acts chapter 4 and verse 22 tells us that he's over 40 years old. There's no telling how many times John had walked by him. Because see, in the Old Testament, you had to go to church. I miss the Old Testament. You had to go to church. You didn't have a choice. It wasn't an option. So there's no telling how many times Peter and John had walked past this guy because he had been there, the Bible said, since his birth. He was crippled from his mother's womb. And every day they carried him and laid him at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for alms. So he, had, he recognized these guys when they came by. He'd seen them for 40 years or for all these many years. And he said, alms, alms for the poor. And that's when Peter made his famous statement. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he grabbed him by the right hand and jerked him up. And he went running and leaping and praising and thanking God. I mean, John, John was there. He saw it all. He knew all the other disciples and all the miracles they did. He had miracles of his own. No doubt he knew a young whippersnapper by the name of Paul that got saved and then got filled with the Holy Ghost and then went in the ministry. And he had some miracles. I mean, John knew it all and knew everybody. Right? Now, see, in the, in, the, in the business world, that counts for something. In the business world, uh, salesmen or, or guys that are trying to get money out of somebody, they go, they go chase down an older guy that's a success and try to learn from him. Man, if he likes to play golf, they learn how to play golf, and they go, they go play golf with him because now he's stuck for 18 holes that they can just pick his brain and talk to him. Amen. Oral Roberts is my really good personal friend. He told me one time, he said, Terry, I've raised more money on the golf course than I ever raised in church. True. He said, I've raised more money on the golf course than I've ever raised in church. So he said, man, those guys want to go play golf with me, so I can get them out there and, man, get the money out of their pocket. And tell them they need to support a project or they need to do this or they need to, you know. And uh, you remember back when I was, a what, a teenager maybe, there was this commercial about an insurance company here in America called E.F. Hutton. Remember those commercials? In, in, in investments? And in, in, in the commercial would say, when E.F. Hutton speaks, and all of a sudden the whole set would get quiet, everybody just stop. Because everybody listens. Why are they listening? Because he's such a success. You remember when Ford Motor Company was, or excuse me, Chrysler Motor Company was bleeding red. It was bleeding red ink. It was going under. It was going out of business. And so Chrysler came over to Ford and hired an old boy by the name of Lee Iacocca. He's an American legend now, an American success story. And they took Lee Iacocca out of Ford and put him in charge of Chrysler, and he made it a booming success. And then after a few years, he retired, and then he commanded all kinds of money to go speak at universities or speak at business meetings or whatever. They paid him thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Just, 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 Mr. Iacocca, just tell us one secret. 
Just tell us one thing. Just tell us one thing. We're going to sit here and listen. You just, you just, you just tell us the secret. All right? Remember General Norman Schwarzkopf, Stormin' Norman? Whenever Saddam Hussein decided he wanted Kuwait and he went over and took over Kuwait, and uh, Stormin' Norman went over there and in a hundred hours, a hundred hours, kicked him out of Kuwait and kicked him all the way back to Baghdad and gave Kuwait back to the Kuwaitis. Tremendous success. Tremendous success. The hundred hour war. And then he retired, and I read his autobiography, and here's what he said. He, he said. he said, here's why I'm retiring from the Army. He said, we won World War I, we won World War II. He said, and we tied in Korea. And we lost in Vietnam. And he said, and I was in Vietnam, and I was embarrassed and ashamed. The greatest military on the face of the earth. And Washington wouldn't let us fight. Our own politicians wouldn't let us win that war. Killed 58,000 of our troops because we couldn't go in that thing. And he said, and now we got a guy named Bill Clinton coming into the White House. And he's going to bring homosexuals. He's already said he's bringing homosexuals into the military. And he's going to take our military back down to where it used to be a joke. And he said, I'm going to quit while we're on top because right now we're the best in the world. And he said, so I'm quitting. While we're on top. And I mean, when he quit, he commanded thousands and tens of thousands to make speeches and travel the circuit and go to universities and go to businesses and go to all kinds of places. And they'd bring him on TV as an expert anytime there's a war or a skirmish somewhere. I mean, when, when Norman Schwarzkopf talks, you're going to listen. Well, that's how I feel about John. See, when I was a teenager, my, my heroes were always preachers. Bible heroes. I used to be a youth leader in my home church, and I, in my, my, my youth group outgrew my pastor's Sunday morning service. I mean, I had a dynamite youth group. And uh, I'd go check on my kids, on my youth, and I'd walk in their bedroom, and they'd have some poster on the wall of some rock star. And I'd walk in their bedroom, and I'd say, is, is that your hero? Is that your hero? That's who you go to bed looking at every night? That's you. I said, you, you know, you know, he died. He choked on his own vomit to an overdose of drugs and he's in hell today, right? That, that's your hero. Or I see another rock star I say, you know, he's dead and in hell today. You know, he did this and this. he's in hell today. That, that's your hero. See, my heroes have always been right in here. Men and women of God, people that will stand up for God. And so when I read third John, I probably read it different than anybody on the planet because I read it from the perspective that I just gave you. This is John. And he's 90-something years old. And he's at the end of his life. And he's at the end of his ministry. And we're at the end of the Bible. God chose to put his book at the end. Right? Right? And so I started reading it. But I will not with ink and pen write to you. I trust I shall shortly see you and speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Love your big brother John. It's just a letter. That's all it is. It's a letter to the church. But first of all, the Holy Ghost gets on him to tell us something. So he says, he says, uh, the elder to the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, verse 1. Now, anytime one of these men in the Bible use that word truth, anytime they use the word truth, they're talking about the word of God. Jesus said in John 17, Father, thy word is truth. So to a, to a person of God, truth means the word. Right? And he says, so to the well-beloved Gaius, who I love in the truth, Truth. Now, verse 2, beloved. Now, if he uses the word beloved, is he talking to Christians or sinners? Yes. He's talking to Christians. I'm not going to ask you a question, a trick question. If I, if I ask you a question, I know you know the answer. I'm not trying to trap you. All right? Beloved, he's talking to Christians. I wish, now wish isn't a Bible word. Never say I wish. If you look in the margin, it says I pray or I desire. You know, the Bible's not Aladdin's lamp, and you don't, you don't rub it and, 
and get a genie and get three wishes. You know, you don't ever wish to God. He said, Beloved, I pray or I desire above all things. Now, I've preached all my life, and Kevin and Melinda can tell you, all my life, I, when I get to the word all, I say that's the longest word in the Bible. All. And when John, 90-something years old, and he's done all the stuff I just got through telling you he's done, when that man says all, it's serious. Now, just think of this old man, 90-plus years old, the end of his life, the end of his ministry, and think of God, the end of the Bible, because the God's writing this, the Holy Ghost is writing this, A-W-L, all scriptures given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, right? So the Holy Ghost is saying, above all things, I'm going to tell you one secret. And that's what John's saying, but beloved, above everything else, above all things, above everything. If I could just tell you one secret, if I could just tell you one thing, this is it. Boy, he's got my attention. I even said to the Lord one time as a teenager, I was reading this, I said, Lord, the Holy Ghost wrote this. And the Holy Ghost wrote the whole Bible. And yet the Holy Ghost is saying now above everything else. I said, Lord, did you ever read the Bible? I did. I was a teenager. I said, did you ever, did you ever read this? This is good stuff. Do you, you ever read from Genesis all the way through? Yet here at the end, you say now above everything else. Are you kidding me? Above everything else? That's what he said. The Holy Ghost saying, now listen, above everything else. I'm going to tell you a secret. And that's what John's saying. Above everything. Guys, listen to me. If I could just tell you one secret before I die, here it is. Are y'all with me? Yes, sir. See, John got my attention. I mean, as a teenager, I said, you are kidding me. Really? John says above everything else, and he's 90-something years old. Man, I'm going to hear this. And he says, above everything else, I, I pray, I desire above all things, that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I read that when I realized that as a teenager. I said, I said, really, John, really? That's it? That's it? That's your big revelation? That's it? You're 90-something years old, and all you can come up with is you want me to be healthy and have some money, be prosperous? You're going to say something so carnal as that? Here, you're the great apostle. Looks like you'd say something spiritual. Above everything else, build a church. Above everything else, speak in tongues. Above everything else, build a Bible school. But you said, above everything else, you want me to prosper and be in hell? And then I ask a question. I said, why? Why? What's it to you? What do you care? Holy Spirit, really? That's all you got to say? Really? That's it? Above everything else, you want me to prosper and be in healthy? That's your big revelation? I thought you'd say something spiritual. I thought you'd say win souls. But you're saying above everything else, you want me to prosper? And be in health? I said, what's it to you? What do you care? What difference does it make when the price of eggs in China if I'm prosperous or not? What difference does it make to heaven or hell if I'm prosperous or if I'm healthy or not? Why does it matter? And then I went the other way, like that. And I said, the devil wants the exact opposite of what God wants. If God said up, he'd say down. If God said right, he'd say left. He wants the exact opposite. So if the devil were writing this, he would say, well, he wouldn't say beloved because he hates you. He'd say despised. <laughs> I wish above everything else you would what? Be poor and be sick. The opposite of prosper in hell. I, the devil, above everything else, want you to be sick and to be poor. 
And I asked the same question. And I asked him, why? Devil, what's it to you? Why does hell care whether I'm sick and poor or not? Why does heaven care whether I'm prosperous and healthy or not? What, what difference does it possibly make? So it's not one of these spiritual, mystical, ethereal things of one of these days when your soul starts prospering and gets healthy, then your body will. No, he's saying, look, I want your soul to catch up to you. To your body. I mean, I want your body to catch up to your soul. I want you to be prosperous and healthy in your body, just like you are in your soul, even as you are in your soul. Does that make sense to you? Well, I hope you enjoyed that little excerpt. It was an exciting time last night. And you know, God showed me some things about 3 John uh, so long ago. I mean, back when I was a teenager and to realize that John was an old man at the end of his life, the end of the Bible. And he said, if I could just tell you one thing, just one thing, one thing. I know a secret. And that That's is right. you must be prosperous. You yes. must be in health in order to get the Great Commission fulfilled in order to do what God want you to do. So we had a tremendous time. If you want to get a hold of that audio, you can. And uh, it's, it's just been a good time here in, in, uh, in Virginia. Yeah. Looking forward to the rest of our time here uh, on Miracle Mountain here at River Church yes. uh, with Pastor uh, Ricardo Watson. And uh, we're excited about that. Yes. And right now here is before we leave today, we just want to remind you that we're coming up here on our JMICF orphanage uh, offerings that we're going to be receiving here at the end of the year. Uh, this past year, we did over 40 orphanages in 26 different countries, Terry. That's right. Praise that is God. absolutely stunning. Thank you for stunning. helping us do that. Thank it's, you. It's, it's really two things. It's the yeah. it's the, the, the end of the year giving yeah. for JMICF, but it's also the beginning uh, of the Christmas season and the Christmas Orphan That's Project. Right. So That's you'll right. hear more about that shortly. We've got, a, we've got a message for you to watch right after this. We are here in the year 2022, the year of our Lord 2022, to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God, to focus on helping children around the world. Last year we did 42 nations in 20, 20, 42 different orphanages in 26 different nations, and we are just delighted to do that all the time. Besides all year long, we're helping widows and, and homes of people that are in need around the world. You can give through Terry Mize Ministries through terrymize.com. We just look forward to hearing from you. It's going to be a great time. We're going to do great things and we're going to do it together. God bless you. We pray all of God's abundant blessings on you coming in and going out. Bye-bye. We are so thrilled to have been with you on the program today. There's so much happening. Uh, I know if we see it in the natural, it's that even that much more in the spirit, but always want you to remember, uh, no matter what's happening in your life, that you are more, more than, than conquerors. Bye-bye. I said, God, if he pulls the trigger, my job is to believe your word, and your job is to do something about the bullet.